Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the founder of Fennec Consulting and an expert in the precious metals and mining space. We're going to be discussing, of course, gold hitting new nominal all-time highs. We're going to be talking about silver. When will it finally break out? Could it go back to all-time highs this year? And of course, my favorite commodity of them all, uranium. It's John Fennec. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Jesse. Nice to be here. So before we dive into all those aforementioned commodities, I first want to take a step back and pick your brain about the main themes and trends you're currently paying attention to when it comes to the commodity sector. I put this in my newsletter to investors about eight or nine months ago. It, it was like you're either in camp A, like a momentum investor chasing tech, NVIDIA, et cetera, or you're kind of a value investor and trying to find value where you can, which is difficult in a market that's overheated like this. So clearly as a value manager, we've been overweight gold and silver throughout this run. Um, nice to see silver finally breaking 30, which is... Uh, a huge resistance level, which it hadn't broken for 11 years. Um, and it's it's testing that, you know, yesterday. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, more signs of hope for silver, which we'll get to later. But what I'm seeing is sort of gold is running alongside of the U.S. dollar up until recently, right, which is unusual. Um, it does happen in history, but the dollar has been running up alongside of the do uh, of, of gold, alongside of Bitcoin, alongside of the broad market, making all time highs. It's it's just like a total, you know, Gordon Gecko moment in the market where everyone's just greedy. And at some point, that bubble bursts, and you have to get real and say, "How much money have I made in this house that I own over the last eight to ten years? A lot, probably, depending on where you live, right? Like, take some profits." I told your listeners last year I sold all my my homes because I just don't care if I'm at the top, right? It's it's like it doesn't make any sense to me where prices went after the COVID situation because that was an inventory issue in a lot of U.S. markets, right? When that wears off, you're going to have some real pain um, as a, as as a real estate investor. I think you know in 2025, um, and maybe rates come down soon enough to save that sector. We'll see, but I don't think so. I don't think if you Remember, Jesse, when we talked in January, right, the Fed was talking four to five rate cuts this year. Now we're talking one to two, right? So like if you held your house thinking, oh, okay, the Fed's got my back. They don't have your back right now. So I think it's it's just going to be a real interesting period of time from September 18th Fed meeting all the way through the election. Um, there's going to be a ton of volatility, very tradable moments for investors. But yeah, to, to answer your question, that's what I'm seeing. A lot of things running up alongside of each other. The biggest takeaway there is gold, right? Gold has now a bigger following. It's not just central bank buying, in my opinion. It's big retail investors that are saying, I need protection in my account, and this is a way for me to hedge. Well, let's talk about gold, You know, reaching 2,500 and change nominal all-time highs. I've been trained by Rick Rule to say that. Um, because obviously adjusted for inflation, it's not quite there. Is this a time to proceed with caution now that things have kind of reached this, some might call it a fever pitch, we're starting to see some mainstream attention come in, but not as much as you'd expect with this type of number on the gold price. Are you expecting a pullback from here or do you see more strength ahead for gold? Well, pullback would be normal. Um, we've seen very minimal pullbacks, right? Every time we get below 2350 or, you know, somewhere in the 2300s, you're starting to see buying coming, fresh buying coming in, which is really unusual. But last year we said, stated on your show, 1900 held for over five months on a closing basis. Literally no day broke 1900 on a close. And we said, that is forming a new floor on gold, which is a very bullish chart pattern, right? And now we're seeing the same, let's just call it 2300. We, we can't seem to break 2300 to the downside. So some of these naysayers that are saying we're going to revisit 2000 to 2050 or something, it's like, I think the world's too uh, complicated now. Um, you know, since we last interviewed, you've, you've had a, pres a president step away in the U.S. To, to let Kamala Harris run, right? You've had an assassination attempt. This is in the U.S. This isn't in some, you know, small country where people don't really follow the news. Like, this is going to be like a, a knockdown, dragout fight, I think. 
starting September 10th at the at the first debate. So it's going to be really important for investors to watch September 10th, September 18th with the Fed, right? Get get a get a, get a sense for where this market is headed. And the biggest thing, because I mean, I, I always try to protect the little guy who's got his 401k up there or 43B. It's like, look at your investment account when you watch this video and see how much money you've made since 2009. It is a lot of money if you've been in the market. You have to be able to take some profits at some point. That's part of investing, right? It's like you can't just buy and hold forever. Um, and and so I, I, you know, myself, I mean, I, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Like I said, I sold my real estate. I've got less than 10% in non-commodity stocks, right? Like, so I've got some Pfizer and some like large cap stuff with dividends, but like very, very, very little exposure. And I'm very comfortable with that at these prices. Hey guys, just a quick break to hear from today's sponsor, ARK Silver Gold Osmium. They offer personalized service and competitive prices with no minimum purchase for silver, gold, platinum, or osmium. Here's just some of the comments left on this YouTube channel about ARK SGO and owner Ian Everard. Have bought from ARK, good source and price. I cannot say enough good about Ian and his company. He is the most honest individual I could find in order to buy precious metals. If you are looking to buy precious metals, I recommend Ian at ARK Silver. He is a straight shooter. So go to arcsgo.com and contact Ian Everard today at 307 Two six four nine four four one, or by email at ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. I wanted to throw this at you because you brought up Kamala Harris um, entering the race and now she has proposed a tax on unrealized capital gains. I believe it's for people with a net worth of $100 million or more. But of course, these types of policies always start very high. And then over time, once they're accepted, they start to trickle down. Well, 50 million is quite a lot of money. That's still an undeserving, rich, greedy person. Let's punish them as well, on and on. Um, if that policy, first of all, do you think it's it's realistic that that policy would ever be implemented? And if it were, would that have a catastrophic effect on, on US markets as all of these high net worth individuals maybe started to cash out in advance of, of it coming into effect? That's a great question. I mean, it's very, anything is possible, right? I mean, and so you have to be able to look at that. The good thing is with what you just said, you have months to game this. Like it's not something you have to worry about tomorrow or next month. It's it's going to be like, you know, what January is when she would get into office. So, I mean, it, it's like never, not, not right around the corner. Uh, I don't think any candidates won in history where you're you're talking about that kind of a percentage gain and capital gains increases. That's just not a friendly thing to, to Wall Street. And Wall Street matters when it comes to presidential elections, in my opinion. Interesting thoughts. I want to talk. We were just talking about gold itself, but now I want to touch on the miners because we're seeing a continuing divergence in the gap between the gold price and the mining shares. Uh, now, when it comes to the majors, a lot of them are performing exceptionally well, Agnico Eagle being a, a standout, reaching all-time highs, currently sitting at all-time highs or around that area, I believe. However, when we go further down the chain into the developers and especially into the junior mining space, the explorers, this is a sector that a lot of people expected to kind of explode or go parabolic as gold reached all-time highs, and it hasn't done that yet. What are your thoughts? Will that gap close coming up soon? And also let us know any um, equities in particular, any companies in particular you're watching or you're investing in in the gold space that you think are worth paying attention to. Yeah, we've talked about the two major ETFs in the mining space, GDX and GDXJ from Van Eck on your show multiple, multiple times. And we said when GDX was holding like that 2550 level, that was extremely bullish because it went back to test that this year. And it, it literally, within pennies of that level, bounced. And that was your indication to see a double you know, bottom in something like that with, with real companies that are producing to, to get behind that trade. And now we're at 38, a little over 38 on GDX, right? But we touched on 40 not long ago. I think GDX looks amazing here. Look at the earnings of, of some of the companies you just named. Agnico had another great quarter. Newmont, uh, I think the largest holding now in GDX had a, had a solid quarter. Their ASIC, they were all in sustaining cost was high. It was over 1550, which was a little alarming. But when gold's at 23, 24, 2500, who cares? You're making such margin and, and such free cash flow that I think that's what Wall Street is going to uh, 
to gravitate towards first is once we get the pull up, pull back in the broad market, they'll, they'll, they'll move to AEM and NEM and Barrick had a really good quarter, GOLD. They'll move to those kind of safety names first. And then you'll start to see the trickle down effect that we as investors have been hoping for, for, for a way long time right now. I mean, the last time we saw these things take off was 2020, but um, I'm, I'm as more, I, I mean, I don't lose any sleep at 2,500 gold. I mean, it's just a matter of finding gold companies that you can get behind and do the research. So, I mean, I just talked to first Nordic metals, uh, FNMCF. They are at 24 cents U S right now. They ran all the way up to, I think it was around 35, 40 cents and, and, and announced the deal with Agnico, speaking of Agnico, on July 15th. And um, when you see them doing a deal with a major like that and have, you know, two and a half million ounces of gold in the ground, and then they just announced a finished deal today. Um, I mean, look, Sweden, Finland, these are not like the Congo. Like th There's not the same risk that you would have in these jurisdictions it took me as an investor some time to get behind it because I had to do my due diligence on these countries to make sure that there wasn't like problems under the hood. But I, I haven't seen any at this point. And Finland, would, which would arguably be more risky, right, because you've got a closer proximity to Russia. Um, it's not their, their prime asset. They're going to be drilling Sweden, right? So um, I like that stock here at, at 24 cents a lot. I think they're going to you know, do better things as the year progresses and get to that over that 3 million ounce kind of goal. And, and as you know, once you get to that 3 million ounces, you start to really attract people, you know, um, I think Cartier resources, you've mentioned on your show before, because I like to tell people what didn't work, right? That hasn't worked yet. Um, ECRFF, I, I think I mentioned that 50% higher on your show, probably twice. Um, it's trading at 4 cents US right now. Why? I mean, Philippe just doesn't spend money frivolously. He's a really good CEO. He spent most of his career with people in, you know, like senior people at Agnico, right? So he knows the game. If you look at where they are in Canada, Agnico is very, a huge shareholder of them as well, just like First Nordic, right? So I look for things like that, Jesse, where you've got a 10, 15, 19.9% position in the company. Why wouldn't you want to take the whole thing out of 2,500? I'm not saying that deals are imminent, but I'm saying that in a hot market, these these majors are real smart. They're they're kind of biding their time right now, and then they're going to throw a low ball offer, maybe a thirty percent premium. And I, I can tell you, guys like Taj and Philippe are too senior. They're just going to be like, no, we're not going to do that because we're big shareholders, right? So you always have to look at the capital capital structure to see, like with Marathon, we didn't have that, right? We didn't have that thirty percent plus kind of locked up in the in the cap structure. So that CEO sold for pennies on the dollar to Caliber, which I think was a great deal for Caliber. Terrible deal for marathon shareholders, right? That's why we're invested in both of those companies is that both of those guys have skin in the game. They can both show me, hey, we have over 30% of our flow tied up in great hands here. We're not going to sell at, at bargain basement prices. And lastly, on the gold theme, we always try to give names like Agnico and Newmont that have some more liquidity. One that is trading with a penny bid ask regularly on the New York Stock Exchange is Dakota Gold, which is DC. Um, I've known Jonathan Ott only for a year, but he ran Gold Standard Ventures. Bob Quartermain, who's in the Mining Hall of Fame, is their chairman. Between Bob and Jonathan, they own 16% of the stock, right? So, like again, heavy management ownership. You can kind of see the themes that I look for. They're in South Dakota. South Dakota is a very mining-friendly place, like Canada, like Sweden. Like, you know, I'm not trying to step away from my comfort zone and, and try to get active in stocks that I, I can't get behind. Well, let's discuss silver, not at all-time highs, very clearly. Um, people are wondering when that's going to be. I know your your good friend Don Durrett, who we've had several conversations on the VRIC channel, believes we're going to see $50 silver sometime this year. Are you of the same mind? Do you have a bit more of a conservative view? And uh, maybe give us uh, some info on any silver companies you think are worth looking at as well. So all last year on your show, I said silver wouldn't break 26 on a closing basis, and we were right. And this year we said once we broke 26, we would then retest 30 pretty quickly, which we did. And, and when you got through 30, you saw we had resistance between 32 and 33, right? So that's your new resistance level, I think. We have to get through 32 th through that and then through 33 before we can start talking 50. And I get where Don is coming from. We have a lot of similar thoughts about the sector. But Chen Lin just came out, who I respect, you know, with a $50 target. There's a lot of people talking $50 silver here, which is extremely bullish. But 
we're going to make so much money in our portfolio. If clients are interested in silver, we have a bias towards gold and silver. So, you know, I have 41% of my holdings right now in gold equities as of June 30th. Like we're putting, we're putting money into gold stocks and silver stocks, knowing that silver will eventually close that gap to gold. It's not going to come overnight. Like a lot of people are talking like 50 or 55 or 60, you know, gold to silver ratio kind of numbers this year. Like, I mean, it's at 84. Like, I mean, <laughs> we have to get to a, a place where if it goes to 70, you're going to make a ton of money in silver stocks. You don't need 55, right? So in silver, we like Silver X, which is a AGXPF. They just came out with production numbers that were positive a few weeks ago. I think Jose is a great leader. Again, the theme of, of insider ownership, right? He owns 10 to 12% of the float himself. That guy has a lot of incentive to go make that work. And they're figuring out their uh, project in Peru right now. I love Peru as a jurisdiction because, you know, Castillo really put a dark shadow over that country for his entire, you know, tenure, right? But he got jailed, what, 19 months ago? I mean, the guy's out of the way. So the leadership there is not anti-mining at, at all. And um, we like Peru and we own other Peruvian stocks there. Um, and Mexico, I think, is sort of like your wild card right now for silver, right? I just wanted to mention this to your listeners because I don't think enough people talk about this. But that presidential election in June was massively important because we got AMLO out of the way. And now Scheinbaum comes in and she has an opportunity to do something for the Mexican people. We'll see if she does it or not. But I would think it would be Hoover to kind of, you know, see mining as a very important part of their uh, GDP. And I don't. I don't know where that's going, but we're going to have a lot of more information right around October 1st. So we've been bottom fishing silver companies in Mexico. You know, some producers like Guanajuato Silver, GSBRF. Um, I really like James. They have four producing assets. They're going to do 4 million ounces of silver this year. You know, if if, if Don Duran and Chen Lin are right at $50 silver, that stock goes from 17 to 50 probably. I mean, that's how much leverage you have in a silver stock like Guanajuato, who's a producer. Let's touch on uranium. Um, kind of a roller coaster of emotions happening on uranium Twitter, uh, which is a very passionate community of people. Not the best place to go looking for advice, but but a, a good place to go to maybe kill some time, have some fun, talk uranium stocks. Uh, the, the stocks have pulled back fairly considerably. And the, this took a lot of people by surprise, people bemoaning that the thesis is dead you know, demanding that uranium bulls explain themselves. Why is this happening? We then saw Kazadam Prom lower their production targets. That sent stocks briefly flying, which which I suspected when I saw them go up that much in that in one day. I thought, okay, this is a knee-jerk reaction to this news, probably driven by FOMO. And sure enough, we're now seeing them pull back again. We're still down on the year. Is this a time to be buying uranium stocks in your view, or could we see more potential downside up ahead? Well, the spot price of uranium rallied considerably last year and into early Q1, right, of this year. So that's something to always watch when you're investing in uranium stocks. It's the same with gold, right? You have to watch 2,500 gold. If it goes to 2,200 gold, I'm way less interested in buying gold stocks until it, it shows support, Right. You have been seeing support in, in the uranium price somewhere around 75 to 80. I'd have to look at the exact chart, but, um, it, you know, it, it, who cares if you get to 120, 140? It's like, I mean, sure, we all want that if we own uranium equities, but I don't think we're going to need that um, because of the kind of supply concerns that you saw just last Friday, right? I mean, that was big news. The problem with the news, Jesse, is that it's just one release and it's in August. I mean, August is not the time where people are sitting at their desks, you know, hoping for the news that they were they were looking for. I mean, they're on the beach with their kids, right? Like, so it's it's like understanding seasonality is also important. Seasonality in uranium, it's typically a good month in September, October timeframe, right? So like, I think we're setting up for a nice move here. So we're buying, you know, names that we've talked about on your show before. And, and some of these could be trades. I mean, I look at the, the the sector as a longer term play, like a one to three year hold. But Forum Energy, we talked about literally a year ago, almost the day on your show at four cents US, uh, FDCFF. And we said this was an insane buy. That was my word, which I never use like large words or inflammatory language. But I mean, it was just, it got, got ridiculous. It had gone from like, you know, 15 to four. Well, on their drill results in September, the stock went back from four all the way to 15 and a half. It retraced all of that loss 
real quick in like a four to five week period. That's where you get your big is like by putting bids on companies like Forum Now that are actually drilling the same deposit. Like go look at the news flow. They did one tenth of the drilling last year that got the market really excited. They have they have literally a thousand percent more drilling happening right now. And the stock is is back to five cents US. It's like unbelievable. So yeah, to to your point, there's a lot of frustrated investors out there, but the junior stuff will pay off. If you believe in uranium going higher, if you believe in gold going higher, you have to buy the juniors too. So it's just a matter of finding out based on your risk tolerance, like where you want to put money. I would put money in producers, like something like Peninsula, P-E-N-M-F. Look at that news flow the last couple of months on Wyoming. Like they're going to put, they're going to restart um, Lance and the stock is going absolutely nowhere right now. So we, we talked to Wayne on that stock and you know, they've raised the money they've needed to raise. There's going to be some more news coming. But like at five and a half cents U.S., it's like if, if you believe in uranium and you want production, why wouldn't you think Wyoming would be a good jurisdiction at five and a half cents? I mean, the stock is like trading like it's going out of business and they're announcing good news. Right. So it's finding those little things, uh, I guess, you know, needles in the haystack to go through and, and just buy here. I mean, like we talked about in your program before, we don't just hit the, you know, whatever bid is out there. We're, we're patient buyers. And I think investors, you know, should do more of that. What other commodities or metals do you have your eyes on right now? What do you think is maybe flying under the radar that more people should be paying attention to? Well, I think nickel um, is such a critical part of society. Like if you believe in economic growth, you have to believe in nickel, period. Um, the reason the nickel price is down, in my opinion, is because Russia is funding their war effort by selling stockpiles of nickel, platinum, palladium to the Chinese and whoever else, right? And you can see this in the nickel price. Look at the spot price in 2023. It went down, I think, 43%. I mean, this is not like some little insignificant you know, metal on the critical minerals list. This is nickel. And it's down almost half, right? Like one year. So it's like we started to buy juniors late last year into this year that would benefit from a higher nickel price or would be in North America because, you you know, the, the thing with nickel is that the Indonesians really have a stronghold on production, right? And so you have to look for what is Samsung and all these buyers of nickel, what do they want? They want clean nickel. Where do you get clean nickel? You get it in North America. And there's only a handful of companies that are advancing their projects, I think, you know, in a, in a smart way. Um, one of them is Power Nickel. Um, we, we've mentioned that before in your show, PNPNF. I think Terry does a great job of leading. I love his press releases. He's very aggressive. They've gone from a nickel company this year to a nickel, copper, PGM, and gold company. So they, they, you know, I'm not saying they're a third, a third, a third evenly, but they're not just nickel, right? And so look at the copper results they've had from April until now. Phenomenal, phenomenal hits. They've added people to their board. They're doing, they did a big raise at a high price. Good for them, right? Like, I mean, don't do it at a low price and kill shareholders. Do it at a high price. Rob McEwing came in for his second round on the stock. I mean, these are things that you look for. Um, and we've talked about Stillwater Critical on your show before, so I won't go into that one too much. But it's in Montana, also a North American play that we like. And let's pull back from the commodity sector for a moment and discuss the broader market because the S&P and NASDAQ keep making new highs in spite of the short-lived sell-off when the Nikkei crashed. Um is this a sign of strength in the broad market or perhaps a warning that we're going to see a bigger correction up ahead? I wouldn't say it's a warning as much as it's, it's sort of a normal pattern on extended rallies. Like you see these blow off tops form. I would argue that any market that's down 12 and a half percent in one day needs to be investigated as to why that happened. And, and when you look at the Nikkei, this is not a small market. So, I mean, that was a wake up call for me. I've been doing this 30 plus years. So, I mean, you have to respect downward pressure like that, right? And um, we shorted tech that day. We shorted tech the day after the Trump assassination attempt. Um, we, we're, we're seeing these kind of things and saying, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. Like you have to look at these things and, and, and pick a place. And we're not going to short anything in one day. You know, we're going to short it five, 10 times. So if we're wrong, we're not going to get killed, right? We're wrong all the time on the short side. I've been shorting since the 90s. It's very risky and it's not for everyone listening, for sure. You definitely don't want to do it on margin ever, ever, ever. But like there are times when you can say, 
okay, this market or this sector is really overvalued right now, then that's sort of how I feel about tech in general. If, if investors don't believe me, check out Intel. Intel, INTC, worst day three weeks ago since 1974. I mean, this stock is getting pummeled. And it's it's like, we've talked about that on your show before. In fact, I remember telling people I screwed up in, in the year 2000. I bought that stock at 40. It went down to the teens, you know, and then I held it for 10 years to get back to par. I mean, it's it's... I think we're entering a period, Jesse, where you really have to do more due diligence as an investor. The easy money has been made in the broad market. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, you know, a lot of people, including Howard Marks, have pointed out that people have kind of gotten a free ride due to ultra low near zero interest rates. Um, and then that's been just a matter of throwing money into an index fund and sitting back and collecting your 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 profits every year, essentially, is it's just been going up and to the right. Uh you mentioned you were pretty caught off guard by the crash in the Nikkei. I think a lot of people were. What are your thoughts right now on the Japanese market? Um, is this maybe a buying opportunity? I was talking to David Rosenberg, and, and he thinks that over the long run, the Japanese market is actually has a lot of strength ahead of it. I wonder what your thoughts, thoughts are. Do you think per perhaps there could be more downside to come? Do you think this is a buying opportunity? How do you view it? Well, when I view Asia... Um... And Rosenberg's super smart, and we work together uh, at Merrill. Um, I, I, I think that, that um, the problem with saying anything right now is a good buy overseas is that we just don't know what the future holds for the world, right? I mean, like I, I have a zero weight long on international stocks outside of mining or commodity stocks, zero. We are short, you know, uh, we started to short China again after the Japan news. Um, for short emerging markets, um, because I think emerging markets always do poorly when you get huge vol. And we're entering a period of more volatility, right? So I'm not saying his pick wouldn't work out maybe next year or the year after or something, but I always look, you know, three, six months down the road. I'm looking at short term. And then if I get the short term right, I'll be good with a long term, you know, investment track record, right? And and that's takes more work doing it that way than playing themes, but that's just how I'm built. And so like, I look at things right now in international land, very, very suspect. Um, I, I'm not putting money there. So to answer your question, I think people need to understand that when you see a pullback of that magnitude, just ask yourself as an investor, hey, how would you feel if the S&P was down 12.4% in one day? Yeah. I don't think most people would be on board for that. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. Well, John, this has been a fantastic conversation. Always appreciate our discussions. For those who want to learn more, tell us about Fennec Consulting. I know you also have a conference you're putting on called the Commodities Global Expo 2024. So tell us about that as well. Yeah, so I got into the conference business earlier this year, and this one's going to be my first that I'm co-hosting. Um, it's at the Four Seasons in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, October 20 through 22. It'll be a broad commodities conference. As you can tell from this presentation, you know, I'm... I'm uh, a uranium bull, I'm a gold bull, I'm a silver bull. Like I'm I'm not just gold and silver all day long. We have money throughout the commodities complex, including energy. So companies will be attending from all walks of life there. And uh, we'll have a, a mix of larger cap companies um, that are liquid so that if we have financial advisors that show up, they won't complain about the liquidity in the stock, but also we'll have some juniors as well. Um, so uh, that's coming up, and we're very excited about that. We've got a great response. Our, our uh, For investors that want to check it out, it's just topshelf-partners.com. It'll be in the show notes, maybe. Um, and they can just fill out investor registration, and we'll get back within a few days. We're not letting everyone into this because it's at the Four Seasons. It costs a lot of money to do an event there. So we're trying to screen people to say, you know, are you buying mining stocks currently? What is, you know, What are your goals over the next you know, year or two? What are your favorite themes, gold, silver, et cetera, so we can try to match people with CEOs and have them, you know, meet up on a personal basis as opposed to, you know, doing the traditional booth kind of thing at a conference, which works as well. But it's it's just to me, after attending over 100 of these myself, uh, a lot of times at a booth, it gets very frustrating standing there for, you know, two, three days. Um, about our company, you know, fenicconsulting.com, uh, you can check out our performance there. We've been active for almost nine years now with a public track record um, that we're very, very proud of. We're about 6% ahead of GDXJ through June 30. I'm um, probably a little ahead of that now. Um, 
but we're going to have a great year. I mean, I feel very, very comfortable with where we are right now, Jesse, in the markets for our sector, that is. Great. Well, I'll put links to the expo as well as fennetconsulting.com in the description below for people who want to check it out. Thank you once again, John, for coming on and sharing your knowledge with the audience. Of course, Jesse. Thanks. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is brought to you by ARC, Silver, Gold, Osmium. For all your precious metals needs, head to arcsgo.com and contact owner Ian Everard today at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.